actual um, anniversary dates of the actual battle itself um, are September 18, 19, and 20, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this, um, this coming week. Um, but we're using this, um, this weekend um, ahead of those anniversary dates to, um, uh, to uh, bring, hopefully, to, uh, to folks' attention uh, that those dates are, um, are just ahead of us. Um, although, if we were, um, were here on this um, 16th of September um, in 1863, uh, there would be plenty of indications that will very likely in the, um, uh, the next day or so, um, there was going to be a, um, a big contest. Um, the, uh, the two armies are clearly in, um, uh, in the area um, and, um, and making ready themselves for the likelihood of a, um, of a battle. So for, um, for a family like the Dyers, whose farm we are on and will be mostly talking about the battle action that eventually unfolds on that on September the, um, uh, the 20th in this program, um, the, um, uh, the, the sense that something um, big was likely to happen um, would have been growing almost every day. Um, what we're going to do um, uh, in this program is, um, is look at the experience of um, principally some of the batteries, uh, artillery batteries of the 21st Corps, Thomas Crittenden's Corps of the Army of the Cumberland. Um, and on that, um, that Sunday morning, uh, September the 20th, 1863, we're going to start out here and in just a moment, walk from here up Dyer Road onto the, uh, the crest of the rise um, over here. Then we will walk for, um, eastward on the Dyer Road a little ways um, and then turn northward um, along the western edge of, um, of North Dyer Field um, and, um, and repeat uh, much of that route on our way back. Uh, part of our route will be on um, a paved road. Um, we'll be on um, uh, a, a gravel um, trail at one point, um, and then a, um, a now mostly grassy um, uh, the service road um, along the edge of the, um, of the field. So, um, any questions or observations before we get started? Oh, we have one of our fine volunteers out with us um, uh, this weekend. Um, and with the, for this program um, in particular today, um, and um, uh, so along the way, if for some reason um, you have to um, uh, to depart the uh, the group and you wonder where um, it is that um, uh, you left your vehicle, uh, you'll be able to help um, direct you back to uh, to where that is. So, uh, because on this program, we will indeed leave sight of our vehicle. Um, this non-historic road, this um, Chickamauga Road, was constructed by the National Military Park once the Chickamauga Battlefield was established. Um, the uh, the railroad that's just over there um, came into existence um, uh, in the period after the war and before the creation of the National Military Park. Um, and so the park engineer eventually just um, asked um, about constructing a north-south road on the battlefield side of the railroad so his um, wagons didn't have to repeatedly go back and forth across the, uh, the railroad tracks. Um, and so um, this road came into existence. It would not have been here at the time. Um, in the low ground, if you look down there beyond the railroad crossing sign, you can sense that the lowest ground um, is just over there. And then the ground begins to rise up once again. Um, in this, um, this low ground runs a wet weather drainage. You can see a little bit of the cut limestone block uh, bridge that goes over the drainage right there by the railroad crossing sign. Uh, and through this valley um, was a, um, uh, a road known as the, uh, the Dry Valley Road. Um, It's an important um, north-south avenue for the, um, for the Union Army. Uh, today, the historic Dry Valley Road is essentially gone. Um, when the railroad was constructed in the 18, um, uh, or after the Civil War, um, the railroad got kind of first choice of, um, of ground over there in that valley, and it kind of preempted the historic um, alignment of the Dry Valley Road. 
Um, but think about a dirt road running through this valley um, in place of that railroad track. Um, and um, I point these things out um, right now because this is really going to be our best view of this lowest part of, um, of Dry Valley here. Notice that the ground rises over here. Um, that'll be um, a little less evident, a little less evident for us um, in, um, in just a minute. Um, but, um, but then also, uh, we can't see it because of the vegetation, but just down here on the left-hand side of the road is a cast iron tablet similar to, um, to this one. The cast iron tablet down there um, is to George Buell's brigade, and I'll mention them um, in a few minutes in our um, discussion. So um, I can just barely see it um, in the grass down there um, near the crest of the rise where the road goes over. Um, but remember the Buell Brigade tablet is down there and then the ground rises in front of it. This is the tablet for Charles Harker's um, brigade and the ground rises in front of it as well. I'll talk more about them um, in a, um, a few minutes. Also, there are three more tablets that are important in our story. Those for um, Sidney Barnes' brigade, Sam Beatty's brigade, and Dick's brigade, which are on up Chick Vitato Road to the north of us. Yes and no. Um, this is the uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is the one for Barnes. Har Har Harker is um, to the south of us. We're not seeing it either. So Parker and Buell are to the south of us. This is Barnes and then Beatty and Dick. This, these are the tablets for them on the morning of the 20th, but they're not actually on the ground where they were. And I'll explain that. Okay. Just, um, uh, just briefly. Um, we, as we walk by um, uh, this area um, here to, um, to most of your right or now front, um, this is the family cemetery for the Dyer family. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are on the, um, uh, the Dyer farm, and I'll explain a little bit more about, uh, about that farm in a, a few minutes. Um, but um, this is where the family cemetery is located. There are only a few graves today marked with, um, with small stones. There's some right um, down there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, um, um, uh, we don't know um, uh, fully the, uh, the number of Dyer family members that are buried in the cemetery. Um, even the Dyer family does not know all of who is, um, is buried here. Um, the, um, it, it has become a very large and scattered family today, and um, in fact, they can't even agree um, fully on um, a family tree, um, complicated by the fact that just about every generation has the same um, uh, series of Christian names for um, its, um, its sons. Um, uh, every, uh, the son of every generation seems to name his sons um, after the same standard family names, John, James, Robert, Spilsby, um, and um, it just makes um, figuring out um, uh, which John goes with um, uh, which family um, almost impossible. And it's even, even befuddled um, the, the, the Dyer family members who have spent the most time working on it over the years. So. But it, it um, is only rarely mentioned in any of the accounts of the battle, but it is a, a landscape feature here um, at the time. So. Uh, no special house. Yeah. And, um, and the fighting the cooks are from Ohio as well. Yeah, they are. That's what they're down near James, I believe. Yes, they are. There's a cemetery there. It's really old. There's a, uh, a couple of things we got in the picture. Now we're really in the rock today. That um, uh, depicts actually the position of Union troops 
um, at um, in late morning of, um, of September the 20th. Um, I'm, I'm going to use it just initially for some um, some orientation. Um, we um, uh, we started out um, um, in this area. That's where the horse unloading area would be today. You can see the um, uh, the, the water course that runs through that valley called Dry um, uh, or the Dry Valley, and that's the uh, the water course. That's not a full time stream. It's just a um, a, a drainage water uh, runoff um, channel. Um, you can see indication of the Dry Valley Road there. We have walked from there up onto um, to part of this rise um, at um, at this point, and you are now looking eastward across the uh, part of the Dyer family farm. Um, the Dyers were um, uh, in the immediate area of the of the battlefield, one of the most um, uh, well-to-do and successful um, uh, farm families. Uh, the patriarch of the family, Robert Dyer, who actually lived on another piece of property up in Hamlin County, Tennessee. Uh, but Robert Dyer had acquired um, two quarter section land lots, um, one, on, um, one north of the other. Um, and so his property here was um, 320 acres in a um, uh, north-south oriented rectangle, one half mile wide and a mile long north and south. As you look um, uh, to the southeast here, across the uh, the field, you can see um, on the far, um, there's actually somebody jogging along the, the Glen Kelly Road down there. Um, the southern property line of the Dyer Farm um, is just in the woods there, um, beyond Glen Kelly Road. And then the property stretched north, um, all, uh, just off of, um, of my map here for a mile. Um, because it was a large family and um, they had a great deal of available labor. Um, they had been able to clear most of the 320 acres and bring it under cultivation. Um, they had established um, their principal home. We'll see a better um, view of it in a minute. Um, right now on this hill, this strip of woods in front of you obstructs the view of where the farmstead was. Um, but they also had a very large orchard just on the other side of the Dyer Road here. Um, there, there was a very large orchard um, that, um, that covered all of the area, um, just the other side of the Dyer Road. You can see one of the National Military Park's um, uh, pitiful straggling remaining um, trees from a, um, an attempt to reestablish an orchard there uh, many years ago. Um, but um, uh, this, uh, <laughs> this is um, uh, the... Um, um, part of, um, of the, the large Dyer farm. This was a, a big cornfield, um, the area that, um, that we're in right now. Um, the, um, uh, the fighting on, um, on September the 19th was mostly to the, um, to the east of the Lafayette Road, um, but during the course of the day, as the general battle line developed and flowed ever further southward, um, the, um, the, the Union troops fighting east of the Lafayette Road, immediately east of where we are right now, will be driven back um, in the course of that fighting. And while the Confederates who drove them back eventually themselves will be repulsed, um, though many of those Union troops, particularly the men of Horatio Van Cleve's division um, and his two primary brigades that were engaged, Sam Beatty and um, George Dix, those troops will pull back um, uh, uh, westward um, to uh, to reorganize and um, um, Sam Beatty and um, Dick's infantry will mostly be reorganizing in Dry Valley there um, but two of their artillery batteries the 7th Indiana battery whose uh, marker is the one that we um, have just come up to is right um, here and um, the Pennsylvania Battery, variously known as um, Battery B or 26 Pennsylvania um, Battery, um, that uh, battery uh, as well, they will pull back um, here. In fact, the um, four guns of the 7th Indiana Battery will come back to, uh, to this position first um, as, the, uh, the, as Van Cleve's men get pushed across um, the Lafayette Road. And when um, Captain Allison Stevens, the commander of um, the Pennsylvania Battery, 
withdraws the, um, uh, the remains of his battery, he will come back to, um, to this position as well. Um, and both batteries will then begin to make repairs um, to equipment um, that they had suffered um, or for the losses they had suffered in the fighting on the 19th. The 7th Indiana Battery does not have a, a great deal to do. Um, and they will eventually be joined here by their other two guns, which had been detached and fought down in the Vineyard Field area on the afternoon of the, uh, the 19th. But the Pennsylvania Battery had a lot to do. Um, that um, uh, battery of six guns in the fighting east of um, the Lafayette Road had lost three of its six guns. Um, when Confederates appear on the right flank of troops to their right um, and begin to, um, to roll um, the, uh, the Union line up, Confederate infantry will, um, will fire in amongst the horses of, um, of the battery and kill and disable enough of the, um, uh, the horses that um, when the rest of Sam Beatty's brigade is forced to withdraw, the battery has to leave three of its guns in the woods on the east side of the Lafayette Road. Uh, the other three guns are able to withdraw out of the woods across the Lafayette Road, and they will take post in the um, uh, large field uh, on the Brotherton Farm. Many of you all are familiar with the cabin for the Brotherton Farmstead there, and that south of the cabin on the crest of that rise is a line of monuments. Um, that is where um, the three remaining guns of the battery will um, uh, take position and fight. In fact, the battery's monument on the battlefield is on that, um, that line. Uh, but as the um, Van Cleves and other troops in that uh, position are forced to, um, uh, to abandon that position, um, uh, when Stevens um, issued the order to, um, to withdraw, um, he had suffered some additional um, horse casualties. Um, and um, in dealing with that, something caused the breakage of the pole on the limber. The limber is the towing vehicle for the artillery piece, that um, single axle, two wheel vehicle with the chest for ammunition on it. Um, and it has that long pole um, out in front of it so that a horse can be um, um, hitched to either side of that, um, that pole. Um, and the, um, uh, it, the, um, the Lieutenant McDowell, uh, the man who writes the battery's report, um, says that either the struggling animals broke the pole or a shot may have broken the pole. But regardless, um, the, uh, the pole on the limber of um, one of the guns is broken um, and Stevens has to um, abandon that gun despite even his own personal efforts to try to save that gun. And so as the, uh, that Pennsylvania battery streams back from that fighting and sees um, the, uh, the battery, another battery of their division, um, reorganizing here, Stevens will direct the remaining equipment of his battery back to this point as well. And he will begin to, um, to make repairs to try to make those two guns functional um, that he still has remaining. Well, in the course of all of um, this fighting today, uh, or on September the 19th, um, several Confederate artillery batteries had um, had a tough time as well and obscured by the fact that the confederates win the battle of chickamauga is that a number of confederate artillery batteries lost cannon to union forces on september the um uh, the 19th um what further allows this to be obscured is the fact that the confederates capture so many guns on this battlefield by the end of the battle that Confederate batteries that lost guns on the 19th or um, the, eight, uh, the 20th um, could cover that up by either recovering the gun that they had lost when the Federals had to abandon it because they couldn't take it off the field, or by simply claiming another gun that the Confederates captured and say, see, I started the battle with four guns, I still have four guns. <laughs> um, obscuring the fact that at some point during the battle, they had actually lost a gun. 
Well, several guns lost by Confederate batteries, maybe not just from Carnes' um, Tennessee battery, which some of you all know, um, the Pennsylvania battery had had a role in helping to, uh, to capture, um, but there are other Confederate batteries that lose guns as well, and uh, Union troops take those guns to the rear. Well, this is the rear of the Union Army now. And as Stevens begins to reorganize his battery in this area, he is given two captured Confederate cannon. They are smoothbore guns. It's not recorded whether they are six pound guns or 12 pound howitzers that I've ever found. And for some of you all I should uh, point out, we're joined today by Dave Powell, who's written um, a number of uh, works on the, uh, the battle and campaign. Um, and um, he was here to do programs um, uh, yesterday. Today he's coming out to help pull privet. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, um, uh, but Dave, of course, has looked at a lot of this, um, this material as well. Um, and I've never seen any reference to whether they're six pound guns or 12 pound field howitzers. Um, uh, there are secondary sources that claim that they're guns six pounders from Carnes' battery. But yeah, no, but, but no primary sources right. that I found. Yeah, um, but uh, but uh, but on the same side uh, or the other side of that, um, the, um, uh, the some of Carnes' people insist that they recaptured their same four guns, and so it, it's it's hard to judge. Um, and I've never seen a direct primary source that really indicates um, uh, yeah, the, that. The problem is that both the Pennsylvanians and Carnes Tennessee Battery have right. bronze smoothbore cannons, yeah. and so in the back and forth of the fighting on the 19th. Uh, you know, if you add up all the captures, you get something like 20 guns. Yeah. Well, there's only two or three that trade hands, uh, you know, well, about five that trade hands uh, on a, over the course on of On a battle. relatively permanent basis. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, uh, Stevens gets two guns to make good the loss of four guns. Um, and, um, and overnight, um, as the 7th Indiana Battery um, here is marked by the veterans um, and the state of Indiana with this marker and somewhere right nearby um, uh, Allison Stevens um, uh, Pennsylvania Battery they work to get themselves in shape for action on the 20th and by the morning of September the 20th um, Stevens is uh, able to put four guns in the field um, the, the, um, again, we don't know um, uh, what those four guns um, are. Um, Stevens had started the battle with four um, uh, six-pound um, smoothbore uh, guns and two um, James rifles. Uh, by one period source, they were Model 1841 six-pounders that had been rifled. It's almost certainly what they, um, uh, they were. Um, but we don't know whether he lost um, one or both of those on um, on September the, um, uh, the 19th. Um, but by the morning of the 20th, he has at least four guns um, available. Um, the um, uh, Shallow, uh, Swallows um, 7th Indiana Battery and Stevens um, uh, Pennsylvania Battery are um, two of the three batteries of Horatio Van Cleve's um, third division of Tom Crittenden's um, Corps. Uh, as I said, um, uh, Dix and um, Beatty's brigades are reorganizing um, initially in the low ground where Dry Valley Road was at the, um, at the time. Um, but that evening uh, of September the, um, uh, the 19th at the Council of War held by Rosecrans at his then headquarters in the home of the Widow Glen where the Water Brigade Monument is today. Um, the, uh, the plan that um, Rosecrans, George Thomas, Alexander McCook, and Tom Crittenden um, conceived was that Thomas would take responsibility for the left half of the Union front line. Alexander McCook would take responsibility for the right half of the Union front line. And Tom Crittenden would um, uh, use two of his divisions, um, Thomas J. Wood's 1st um, uh, di Division of uh, the 21st Corps and Van Cleve's 3rd Division to um, uh, create a small reserve for the Army of the Cumberland. And it is agreed that the um, small reserve will be massed on the easternmost slopes of Missionary Ridge. Now, when we were looking through the gap in the trees there at the uh, railroad crossing by where we started, I asked you to notice that the ground begins to rise on the other side of the railroad track. 
One of the things that is, um, is often um, uh, not recognized is that uh, Missionary Ridge, which we're mostly familiar with for the part where the Army of the Cumberland charges up on um, uh, November 25th, 1863, that Missionary Ridge is actually 40 miles in length and stretches from northeast of Chattanooga all the way down into Macklemore's Cove. Um, and it is just not that steep, sharp western face that we're used to seeing at Chattanooga, but here it is over a mile wide east to west. And Missionary Ridge actually terraces um, up um, from the east to the west ever higher, with the western crest being the, um, uh, the highest and the most well-defined. Um, where Missionary Ridge begins is, in some counts, even right here where we are. But very definitely, it is the rising ground that you see on the other side of the Dry Valley Road. Um, and um, Van Cleves and Wood's division are directed to mass on these easternmost hills of Missionary Ridge. Wood's division had fought down um, in the Vineyard Farm on the 19th, the two of its brigades that were on the battlefield. Its third brigade is the garrison of Chattanooga. At about 2 a.m., um, Thomas J. Wood directs his two brigade commanders, George Buell and Charles Harker, to march their um, brigades from the Vineyard Field area um, and back to the hills of Missionary Ridge. And they will make that march um, soon um, after 2 a.m. and will go into bivouac on the easternmost hills of Missionary Ridge, just north of where the Widow Glens was. In fact, it was noted by some that they could see the activity around Rosecrans headquarters at Widow Glens. Um, they're uh, arriving shortly before dawn. Um, the men will be issued um, two days rations. Um, and some additional ammunition, and they will make preparation for a coming day of battle. Each of those brigades have a battery of artillery attached to them as well. Um, those batteries um, had, um, had fought down at Vineyard Field. The 8th Indiana Battery had had a really tough time. Um, they had, um, in the initial fighting, had been forced to, um, to uh, abandon the position they had um, had taken, and in the process, uh, enough animals were shot down by the Confederates, they had to leave one of the guns on the field. But fortunately, the, um, uh, the Federal fortunes um, uh, were restored a few moments later, Federal forces regained that ground, and they um, retake that one gun. And subsequently, as that seesaw action continued again, the battery had to relocate a second time. And this time, it had to abandon three of its six guns. But fortunately, Federal fortunes um, re were restored, and they recaptured those, um, uh, those uh, three guns as well. But by the, uh, the end of the fighting, 21 horses had been killed or disabled in that fighting. Um, and when they get the guns off of the field, um, they will switch out um, uh, animals from the battery wagon and traveling forge teams and one of the caissons to then get six horse teams once again for each of the six guns. Um, and in the process, they use up, uh, and also they had lost one limber uh, that was entirely um, destroyed or disabled, uh, they, and they have to abandon one of the caisson bodies, that other vehicle that has two chests on it and an extra wheel to carry additional ammunition. Um, where the battery did that reorganizing was separate from where their bear brigade, Mule's brigade was, and the 6th Ohio battery of Harker's um, brigade was um, reorganizing a se separate from its brigade also. Um, and so when uh, Wood moves his troops up this way, the batteries take separate routes. Um, and the 8th Indiana Battery, now with six guns but only five caissons and diminished teams on the battery wagon and traveling forge, will rejoin its brigade on the hills of Missionary Ridge. The 6th Ohio Battery takes a more roundabout route um, and finally comes into the dire field from the south end. Well, that morning, after daylight, um, with um, 
the um, uh, union line um, being unrefined and developed with um, Van Cleve's troops, now his three brigades, now massed on the hill um, just to the uh, west of where we are now, um, and Wood massed on hills to the, um, to the south. Um, as adjustments are made in the Union line, both Wood and Van Cleve are ordered to move their divisions forward to reduce the amount of space between the reserve position and the line developing in the woods east of the Dyer Farm. Um, and Wood will order his two brigades forward, and they will deploy on this rise of ground to the south of where we are right now. And Van Cleve will order his th um, three brigades forward onto this rise of ground. Um, and as Parker's brigade um, moves up, its battery comes up and actually um, climbs up through the orchard and up onto the, um, to the rise of ground. And Harker says that they take position near the, um, near the, uh, the front of, um, of his brigade as they deploy. Um, and um, and uh, both uh, or all, um, all five of these brigades will deploy in the standard formation of, uh, for a brigade at the time of two regiments up and two regiments back. And so um, beginning about um, 9 a.m., um, try to imagine um, three brigades, uh, or excuse me, five brigades of Union troops in a reserve position, two lines on this very ground behind the main Union line formed in the woods across the dire field. You're now on the reserve position um, of the, um, uh, the Army of the Cumberland before the fighting began on the morning of September the 20th. Questions, observations? Anything you want to add, Dave? Just want to point out that all five brigades have been engaged heavily on the yes. 19th, as Jim has described. I'm a numbers guy, and I like to know uh, relative strengths, um, at least when it comes to, to, to this sort of thing. We're really talking about no more than 6,000 troops in these five brigades, roughly 1,100 men per brigade. Um, uh, just to give you some perspective, there's at least two Confederate infantry divisions that enter the battle at least 6,000 men strong. So the Army of the Cumberland's reserve, uh, while important, is also by now greatly reduced. Right. And it doesn't last long. No. If you're going to abandon the guns, I assume some, you do something to sabotage them, spike them or something? So well, they, you, they, um, they did they carry a spike um, in the limber chest, um, which was a piece of metal um, mm -hmm. with barbs on it. That could be driven down into the um, uh, the the, um, the vent of the gun, um, and most guns have a separate vent piece, um, a um, a copper alloy um, uh, insert that would be screwed down um, into the vent, um, and it was um, soft enough that you could take this iron um, piece of iron with the barbs on it, stick it in the vent hit it with a hammer a couple of times, drive it down into that um, softer copper vent piece, um, and then hit, it was made out of brittle um, um, iron, hit it on the side and you would break it off at the, the top of the vent, close the vent up. Um, but um, um, uh, McDowell, the officer who writes the report for the um, 26th Pennsylvania Battery, um, does not um, indicate that they, um, they were able to spike any of the, um, of the guns. So. Well, did they have the the means to drill through that relatively quickly? I mean, could they? No. What what to uh, to unspike the yeah. gun? Um, and they um, they'd have to um, uh, to drill two small holes in that vent piece opposite one another at a certain distance apart, and then they used what we would think of today as a snake eye tool. Um, has a, a it's a tool with two small projections on it that would fit down into those two holes that were drilled, and you would unscrew um, that vent piece. But that requires a fair amount of time to do. That's also one reason why um, uh, spiking guns was um, something that was not done a lot during the Civil War, uh, because just with as with the 8th Indiana Battery, they hoped to be able to recover their guns within just a matter of minutes. Um, the most practical way to disable a gun on the battlefield was to simply run off with the implements and the ammunition. 
Um, and um, if you can get the limber off and get the sponge rammers and the hand spikes um, uh, off and the friction primers, um, the enemy might um, might capture it, but um, you can't do anything with it. So. Unless he thinks ahead and brings his own. But right. Very, very a lot of infantrymen <laughs> running around with what? Yeah. Um, in the Battle of Missionary Ridge, um, the, the federal surge to the top of Missionary Ridge, um, capture a couple of Confederate cannon just at the moment that they were ready to be, um, be fired. They're loaded. They recognize that they're loaded, um, but the Confederates have run off with the, uh, the friction primers. Um, and um, uh, there's one account where um, he doesn't say that he takes a cartridge and pours some powder down the vent, but he, he fires the muzzle of his, um, of his gun into the vent to then discharge the, um, uh, but I don't want to be anywhere near um, a 12-pound um, Napoleon that is discharged that way. Particular field expediency is a little risky. Yeah, that that may well be a um, an old soldier's tale from because um, that's not in a period um, source. That's in a post-war source. If you have two burly sergeants, there is one other way to do it, and that happened over in uh, uh, in Poe Field. Uh, basically, the two sergeants in the heat of the fighting in Poe Field on the morning of the 20th or midday on the 20th, when that line is collapsing, uh, they simply remove the pins that hold the tube to the ca uh, carriage and pick up the tube, 800 pounds or whatever, and throw the tube off the carriage. And at that point, the gun is disabled. But you really need two big sergeants. <laughs> Jim, you may have covered this, but was this view open at the time? Um, this is actually pretty close to what it would have been. We're missing the orchard that was over here on the south side of the Dyer Road. This block of woods was probably a little bit thinner, um, but it's about the right width, east and west. So it is September. There's still leaves on the trees. Um, more of this hilltop would have been open. The wood line would have extend or would have uh, begun on the um, uh, the slope going down slope there, and then more of the valley would have been open. So, but as we look this way. This is um, pretty close to what it was. All right, um, I have discovered um, a trail that um, has not gotten any attention um, uh, this summer, uh, as you have discovered yourself. Um, and so we need to um, to get back out on the trail there. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, no, I wasn't. Um, what Dave was um, was mentioning was. Um, Van Cleve's men, um, as they um, um, are here, this is where they're going to drop their, um, their knapsacks, their packs. And so when they march away from here in a few minutes, they're going to be piles of soldiers' knapsacks. There's a line of knapsacks here that, that they ultimately will not see again. Um, each pile guarded by a, um, a, a recently um, disabled soldier. 7th Indiana Battle. position on the front line. Uh, now, at least in Harker's brigade, when he had deployed on the hill here, he had also deployed skirmishers in front of his two regiments. So even though he's in a reserve position and he's behind the main Union line in the woods up there, he's already got his skirmishers out in front. Um, but now the order is to move up and take position on the front line to relieve some other troops. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the order is given for these five um, brigades to, um, uh, to move forward. Um, and 
There are several um, accounts that talk about what a martial display this was when almost simultaneously five brigades, each in two lines, begin to march forward across this ground towards the front Union line. And so now as we go forward, I won't make you form up into um, to two ranks to have the assuring touch of elbows, um, but as we go forward on the, um, the Dyer Road, um, try to imagine this view of about 6,000 Union soldiers um, in, um, in two lines, um, the um, um, uh, <clears throat> 10 regiments in, um, in the front line and 10 regiments in the second line moving across um, uh, this ground. What, what time is this? Um, this would be about 9 a.m. 9 to 9.30, 9.30. yeah. In the, it's, well, let's see, they're online by 9.30, so um, they're not moving very fast. Um, it's, it's, probably, yeah, it's probably just after 9 when they start, and um, uh, it takes a while to do this release. Car coming. Uh, step to the left, please. We got a car coming behind us. Okay, um, on um, uh, this overall map of the morning of, um, of September the 20th, it depicts the Union line as it was at um, about 9.30 when the Confederate attacks um, uh, began. Of course, the Union line has bowed out around the Kelly Field, then runs south on the west side of the Lafayette Road through the front of Brannon's Woods and Davis's divisions. And the Union line is in that block of woods um, there across the um, uh, across the field. We are behind that um, uh, this this part of the Union line. Kelly Field's off the uh, the north end here. Uh, we're behind the main part of the Union line, um, and um, Van Cleves and Woods divisions have been moved up on this rise, um, and now they have been ordered forward. Um, Wood is moving forward specifically to relieve Thomas J. Wood, or excuse me, James Negley's division, um, which has been in position here astride the Dyer Road um, as it goes on eastward to the Lafayette Road. Negley um, has been wanted by George Thomas up on the left end of the line, and Rosecrans had issued orders that um, Negley be relieved um, by troops from the reserve. Um, and eventually it will be Tom Woods' um, division that conducts that relief. And Woods' um, two brigades, Buell on the right and Harker um, on the left, will move forward to take Negley's place. However, um, as David noted, those two brigades have been in battle. Um, on the 19th, they have lost strength. They are not as large as the two brigades of Negley's division, um, on that line. Therefore, um, Harker and Buell do not cover the same frontage that Stanley and Surwell um, did. And um, as a result, Barnes's brigade of Van Cleve's division, the brigade on the left of Harker's brigade, is ordered to move forward as well and, and to respond and to take orders from um, uh, Thomas J. Wood. And so, um, Barnes's brigade marches up into line 
And at the critical moment on the battlefield, um, we have Tom Wood's division of Barnes, Harker, and Buell. That's how Barnes gets up um, on, the, um, on the line. Um, but in this order to Barnes to move up on the very front line, um, no clear orders were given to the other two brigades of Van Cleve's division. They move forward as well, except there are still Union troops in their front. Now, for one of them, Dick's brigade, this soon is all a non-issue um, because they get an order to move towards the left end of the line. But um, Van Cleve's other brigade under Sam Beatty um, continued to move forward, trying to maintain contact with Barnes on his right. But all of a sudden, he literally bumps into the back of other Union troops in position. Um, in particular, John Connell's brigade of Brannan's division. But now the reserve has moved up on the front line, um, and in, re in reality, only one of those five brigades of the reserve is actually going to be used in essentially a reserve-type role, and that was Dick's brigade sent to the left end of the line. Now, all of these brigades have been in action about the day before. Um, I've described to you the difficulty that two of their five batteries had had in the fighting on the 19th. What do you think these brigade commanders of Buell, Harker, Barnes um, have learned um, from the fighting of the day before? The woods of Chickamauga is not a good place for artillery. Um, and so only Buell will take his uh, battery into the woods with him uh, and put it into position on his line. Harker told his battery, the 6th Ohio battery under Cullen Bradley, to um, take position here in the field and be ready to respond to orders. The um, Corps Chief of Artillery, a man by the name of John Mendenhall, a West Point graduate, who many of you all will know, um, earned fame and recognition as a result of the Battle of Murfreesboro or Stones River, where he had massed 57 Union guns to help repulse the Confederate attack of January the 2nd. John Mendenhall is out here in these fields. He knows the experience of the day before. Uh, he sees that his uh, or that the reserve element of the 21st Corps is being fed into line, um, and he um, orders the three batteries of Van Cleve's division to not go into the woods, to stay out here in these fields. And he then begins to also look for another place for those batteries to be positioned. Um, and so now the reserve has moved up and fed into line, um, and um, four of those five batteries are out here in the field awaiting orders. Only the 8th Indiana battery has gone um, up on the line in Buell's um, sector in the woods. Questions, observations? Would Mendenhall have much of a staff? Um, no, no. He, uh, he as, um, as division, or, um, excuse me, as Corps Chief of Artillery, he really wouldn't have had any staff at all. He would have had a handful of enlisted men assigned to him as clerks, um, but, um, uh, but they would not, in the battle, they would not have been serving as couriers or anything. No. Uh, he, um, he's essentially all, all by himself. David, anything you want to add? Just that uh, um, I was always struck by it. Tom Wood actually sends a message to not bring any more artillery into the woods, uh, which which starts this chain of events with, with Mendenhall, because Crittenden then tells him to find a place where he can make the artillery useful, uh, and he picked a good guy. <laughs> The, um, the experience of the day before had, um, had proven that um, the woods here is not a good place for the gun. It's an interesting contrast, too. If you walk Thomas's line along Battle Line Road, that line is studded with artillery. Uh, and if you then if you transition south of Poe Field and walk the Union line, what, what there is of it south, uh, you don't find hardly any artillery. But Thomas's batteries generally have not had the same bad yeah. situation of the day before and Only so division, right yeah. and so maybe they're not learning the same lesson the same way and so there but there are lots of things to think about 
you know, to, to ask the questions, what are these leaders, these commanders, um, how are they analyzing um, what has happened and what and, is likely and to I, happen? And I should be fair to George Thomas, his line is, is better defined and more clearly established. One of the things we'll get from following Jim out here is how often we're moving. Yeah. This part of the line is in motion all the time, almost all the all, time in the morning. Yeah, all, yeah. All righty. Um, we're now going to follow um, uh, Crittenden's um, directive to Mendenhall um, to find a place where those guns might be useful. Well, I should point out, um, just down down here where you see the small pyramid of cannonballs, that is where um, the Dyer family farm buildings were located, or at least the principal buildings on the farm were located. This white house is a post-war Dyer hole. That may happen right after this. I can't remember. Yeah, I, I think he's still in the ranks of the 21st um, here on the uh, at the time of the battle. I remember so. trying to find that out, and I couldn't pin it down. For yeah. Sure. And a lot of those details are um, are, uh, are they're, they're details, and hence not recorded. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I am going to pause here for um, for just a minute, um, and I um, uh, want you to um, to make a mental note of your view. Um, from right about here, more accurately, I should walk you out into the grass a little bit, but um, I just re really want you to, um, to make note of um, this position right here, and then in just a few yards ahead, um, you will start to see some small monuments and markers um, up there. And, um, and notice this particular um, uh, position um, uh, right here because of the line of artillery pieces that we're going to be talking about, it extends actually to about this position. Um, but we'll say more about, uh, about that um, de deployment um, when we gather up um, up there in a minute. But the actual right end of the line of guns would be somewhere in this area, maybe even a little bit further to the south. Uh, and probably out on the, um, on the craft where you see into the low ground. That's it. as we walk past the marker and the tablets there and arrived um, here, you notice that um, those tablets and marker um, deal with the um, 8th Indiana Battery um, attached to Buell's Brigade um, and that we are now at the position of the, uh, the 3rd Wisconsin or at the marked position of the uh, Battery of the 3rd Wisconsin. Um, the um, uh, attached to, um, uh, to Barnes's Brigade and you can see another uh, marker and tablet set there, and there's another one just in the edge of the woods beyond. Um, the, um, hopefully this is an indicator to you that John Mendenhall did find a potential place for those batteries. And you probably should be able to tell by yourself that this looks like a pretty good place for some artillery. All the open ground to the front, uh, rise of the uh, of the ground. Um, this looks like a good artillery position, 
And indeed, we are on the line now where Mendenhall will begin to mass those batteries. The, um, the seventh Indiana battery um, is on the left end of the line. Their, um, their marker is, um, uh, is just out of sight in the, um, in the woods there. Um, to their right was the Pennsylvania battery. Um, Allison Stevens um, battery of just now four guns. Two of them captured Confederate guns. Um, then um, you had the, um, the third Wisconsin battery attached to Barnes's brigade. And the four guns of Battery H, 4th United States um, Artillery. And then the 8th um, Indiana battery eventually um, on this line. Eventually there are 26 guns on this line. Um, six guns in the 7th Indiana battery. Uh, six Wisconsin battery and the um, eighth Indiana battery and four guns each and the Pennsylvania battery and the uh, battery H fourth United States um, artillery. Now we don't know exactly the interval between the guns and the batteries. Um, the standard interval was the guns were on 14 yards center. Um, the um, uh, but there are not uh, accounts that suggest that the guns were up here any, um, any tighter than what the, um, uh, the standard interval would be. At least I've not seen any that say we were hub to hub or we were too close. Um, uh, certainly for the 7th Indiana, um, the, um, the 3rd Wisconsin and Stevens um, Pennsylvania guns, um, they actually had enough time to come up here and get deployed at the proper intervals between the guns. Um, so um, when and, and the uh, when you then start doing the um, the math, this marked line of Union artillery by the monuments, markers, tablets, and plaques um, is today far too short. Where the markers and tablets for the Eighth um, Indiana Battery should be is down there in that area where I had us pause just a few minutes ago, um, that much further to the south. Um, but um, uh, why they are, why the line is compressed like this, um, I can't give you um, any clear answer other than there are several um, brigade positions marked on the battlefield where the uh, markers for the units um, are compressed together, closed together. In generally, or in general, the monuments and markers should be in the center of the unit. Uh, but uh, go over to the uh, to the Starkweather's Brigade position in the woods north of um, uh, the Winfrey Field, and they are all compressed um, very close um, together. Um, the um, uh, Wilson's Georgia Brigade um, set of uh, markers on Brotherton Road. There are a number on the battlefield where they are more compressed together. Um, that may have been uh, kind of a design feature by the, uh, the Park Commission, the veterans. We just don't um, have recorded. Uh, but even though this line stretched further than what the monuments and markers um, indicate, they do give us an indication of this line. Um, the, um, as I said, the first batteries um, on this line are the 7th Indiana, um, the four guns of um, Stevens 26 Pennsylvania um, battery, and um, the, um, the six guns of Livingston's um, uh, 3rd Wisconsin battery. Um, a few um, uh, minutes as, after they uh, begin to take position here, um, the um, uh, battery H of the 4th United States Artillery emerges from somewhere over um, here. That battery is actually attached to John Palmer's division, um, the 2nd Division of Crittenden's 21st Corps. And how they wind up out here is that after having been engaged in Kelly Field, helping to repulse Breckenridge's attack, they have run out of ammunition. And they um, are, um, are in search of ammunition. Um, and George Thomas has told Henry Cook Cushing, the battery commander of first lieutenant, to take his four guns and go in search of his caissons. Um, and he has some indication that they um, must be back here in um, this dire field. And he'll come back and refill his 
um, limber chest from the caissons. That puts him out here in this field when the disaster begins to unfold for the Army of the Cumberland. Um, as you know, um, Rosecrans, who occupied that open spur where, um, uh, near where Harker's brigade had been briefly, um, Rosecrans receives there the message that supposedly Brannon's division, which is in line in the woods across this field from us, um, on through the block of woods there on this map, um, Connell's and Cruxton's brigades, that that division is out of line, and Rosecrans then issues that order to Thomas J. Wood to move up and fill that supposed gap. Of course, um, Wood will move after checking with McCook, and so Wood's three brigades of Barnes, Harker, and Buell begin moving northward. Um, and, the, um, and the Confederates attack at that same moment and penetrate the Union line. And now, here are these batteries of uh, Mendenhall's line that is forming um, up here. And here are the Confederates coming through that gap in the line. Uh, the, uh, the last of Wood's brigade to, um, to be moving is George Buell's brigade. And when they uh, begin to pull out a line, uh, Buell ordered his battery commander, um, East Step, to, um, uh, to move his battery out of the brigade position in line and um, stay to the west or left of the battery as they move northward. Um, and uh, as the Confederate attack begins to unfold, um, there are a couple of interesting accounts of that battery trying to get out of the woods. Um, with evident, um, a, a Confederate attack evident, um, they pick up the pace um, and their guns and caissons are observed bounding over the rocks and logs um, and through the trees coming out of the woods. We can't see that now because of this block of wood, but they come out of the woods and into this field. Um, and as Confederates um, strike the rear of Buell's brigade, and in particular begin to disorder the 13th Michigan and the 26th Ohio, um, East Step begins to look for another position from which he might fire. Um, and as he looks across the field, he sees some rising ground. And what does he see along this rising ground? Already a line of guns. And he directs his battery over this way as well. Now when, Henry, or when Harry Cushing first brought his battery up onto this position, he did not order it into battery. But now, as the Confederate attack begins, he orders his four guns to go into battery, unlimber, and the men go to, um, to serving um, the, uh, the guns. Um, the, um, uh, the 8th Indiana battery will swing into position on the south end of, um, of the line. They, too, will begin to, uh, um, to, to look for targets um, to, um, to take under fire, just as the um, uh, 3rd Wisconsin, the 26th Pennsylvania, and the 7th Indiana uh, as well. Um, however, there is one real problem. What is in their immediate front? Oh, Union troops. Um, and um, there is going to be the concern of potentially firing into Union troops. Um, but as um, Union troops um, are driven back, uh, many of them beginning to, uh, to veer to the northwest to go back towards Chattanooga, as elements of the 13th Michigan uh, come across the field and attempt to fight for a time behind some of the fences in the dire field down to our uh, right front. As the 26th Ohio, with much of its integrity still intact, does the same thing. This is their little marker um, right down here. Um, and the 58th Indiana um, withdrawing across the field and then onto the rise um, over here. The um, uh, and Confederates beginning to appear out of the, uh, the woods. 
One Confederate battery, almost certainly, Bledsoe's Missouri battery, comes out of the woods um, right here into the field. Um, and the federal, some of these federal guns um, uh, see that and open fire, and they say they prevent that Confederate battery from firing any shots. That battery has already tried to fire uh, um, shots in the opening attack, but as they set up by the Brotherton Farm, um, the Confederate infantry, because they got no resistance, swept right up past them before they could open fire. And they had to have the interesting experience of moving their guns forward loaded, limbering them up and towing them forward. They came out um, down here hoping to find a target to shoot at, only to get suppressed. In fact, they don't fire a single round on um, September the 20th. Um, how they unloaded the guns later? Um, <laughs> very is, carefully. Yeah, very carefully. <laughs> um, but um, uh, but they're uh, they're they'll get the uh, the uh, some of the fire from uh, from this position. Um, the um, behind Bledsoe's battery, and particularly advancing under cover of uh, this block of woods right here, are Confederates of the um, uh, of the Dares Brigade and are. Uh, um, Greg's brigade, uh, Calendar Sug, of uh, Bushrod Johnson's division. And they will come to the edge of that block of wood, um, and some of them even out into the cornfield down here, uh, and begin to, um, to fire at the batteries um, at this, um, uh, this position. The batteries then open fire in earnest themselves. Um, and um, it's even switching to the use of canister. The Confederates get that close. Um, the, um, uh, the 13th Michigan and the 26th Ohio will be uh, forced to withdraw, and they'll pull back um, through, the, uh, through the gun line. Um, but as these guns now engage, firing at Confederate targets um, in their front, particularly Confederates at the edge of the, um, of the woods there, um, in the smoke and dust of the, um, the battlefield, um, in the heat of the action, um, with the roll of the ground, um, the, the buildings of the um, Dyer Farmstead, what those batteries did not see was that that part of um, Sugg's Brigade, um, the Tennesseans had been able to push far enough westward that they hit on and beyond the right flank of this gun line, and then they wheel northward and move north and begin firing into the flank of this gun line. Um, and they are going to um, uh, wound um, uh, the uh, significant number of the animals in the, um, the eighth um, Indiana battery. Um, the, um, that fire will also affect um, uh, Harry Cushing's um, Battery H, 4th United States um, artillery, but um, uh, Cushing will um, will order his guns to limber up um, and get out of here. Um, the, as the Confederates continue to advance forward, their fire will next affect this um, uh, third Wisconsin battery, um, and the uh, the Confederates will continue to roll up um, this line. Um, as it becomes clear that um, they can't withdraw the, uh, the guns of the 3rd Wisconsin Battery, the order is to, um, to abandon them. Um, this battery, at least, is going to get off of the field with, um, with many of its horses and its limbers, only leaving the guns um, on the field. The, um, uh, as the line collapses and the Confederates approach, um, Stevens' battery um, uh, up here um, uh, Stevens will give the order to, um, to withdraw. Confederate fire will shoot down sufficient number of horses in, um, uh, in two of his teams that um, um, he's not, um, uh, that those guns will be, um, uh, be lost um, uh, permanently, uh, but, um, but he will get um, two guns off of the field. And in trying to save a third gun, Allison Stevens himself will become a casualty. Now, I haven't introduced him really um, in the story. Some of you all may know a little bit about him, but is there another famous 
prominent, well-known, mid-19th century figure named Stevens. How about Thaddeus Stevens? Alson Stevens is the nephew of Thaddeus Stevens, um, a son of Thaddeus Stevens' brother. Um, but when Thaddeus Stevens' brother died, his brother, um, or um, his brother, uh, that, excuse me, when Thaddeus Stevens died, Thaddeus, or, excuse me, Thaddeus Stevens' brother died, he, um, Thaddeus Stevens was made guardian of the children of that brother. Um, and Alson Stevens, here at the Battle of Chickamauga, is still less than 21 years of age. He has not yet reached his majority. Yet, he has been a battery captain since early in the war. Um, and in this fight, um, dismounted on foot with some of his men trying to save a third piece to withdraw it by hand, Thaddeus Stevens um, will fall. He will, um, will be killed. His body will not be recovered. Um, um, and um, he today un undoubtedly lies as an unknown burial in the National Cemetery in Chattanooga. Um, Thaddeus Stevens, um, uh, even though he and Allison had a somewhat rocky relationship, um, uh, Allison apparently um, decided to, um, uh, to emulate some of his, um, his uncle and guardian's um, uh, behavior um, with, um, uh, with women, um, much to his uncle and guardian's um, disgust, um, you know, um, you know don't, don't do as I do, um, but um, uh, they had, did have a somewhat rocky relationship. Um, however, um, uh, they, they were family. Um, they did have um, a, a fair degree of um, a love for one another, um, and the, uh, the radical Pennsylvania congressman Thaddeus Stevens um, is made at least more vengeful as a result of Alson's um, death here at the Battle of Chickamauga. Now, when you were already on the radical end of the scale, um, you know, how, how do you become even more vengeful? But um, when you read Thaddeus Stevens' correspondence in the post-Chickamauga period, um, he is, um, um, is even more um, desirous of, um, of seeing the war prosecuted with a vengeance against um, those who had attempted to break up um, the United States. Um, the, uh, the 7th Indiana Battery being on the far end of the line um, will um, uh, we'll lose just um, one of, um, of its guns. Um, the, uh, the Park Commission, the veterans, um, will um, we'll indicate um, the, the action at this um, uh, position in one way by a small um, fingerboard along the uh, Glen Kelly Road down here, which um, designates uh, this as the point of capture of nine Union guns. Um, these batteries from these 26 guns will lose actually 15 of them in this, um, this fighting. Uh, a couple of them are probably actually lost um, in the subsequent withdrawal from this, um, this position. Um, so that, um, that probably helps explain why the veterans would designate this as um, specifically the place where nine of the guns um, were lost. Um, Suggs um, Tennesseans um, come up through, um, through much of this uh, position through the um, from ar around the abandoned equipment and the dead horses and past those horses that were still um, alive and struggling, some of them in their death throes, um, past the um, Union artillerymen casualties um, that are lying around, um, and they um, believe that they have um, have done something. They have captured um, guns. Um, in the aftermath of this, one of the staff officers of, um, of this brigade um, will say that he knows for certain that they captured seven guns, um, and he is pretty certain that there was an eighth one. Um, but um, having captured the guns, um, Sugg's brigade is called to, um, or this part of it is called to join the other portion of it to continue the penetration further to the, um, to the west. Um, and they will, uh, will leave 
the, uh, the guns here. This will then allow some of McNair's brigade to come up here. And what then do they subsequently claim? We captured guns. And a few minutes later, um, as McNair's men um, begin to rally and reorganize to move elsewhere, some of Law's Alabamans will move up here amongst the guns. And what do they claim? We captured, we captured the guns. So what, there are about 50 guns captured on this position? <laughs> do you add up the Confe various Confederate claims? So, uh, and they will fight about it. Yeah, and they will fight about it. That's that's why we have that um, that sworn state statement. There are about a dozen individuals who signed that statement by that staff officer. Um, uh, that's why we have that. Um, it's done about um, uh, two to three weeks after the battle. Um, and um, and he says, you know, I know for certain we had seven guns, and I think there was an eighth one. And these men can testify that what I say is correct. They argued about it for a, um, a long time. So. Um, but despite the uh, the effort of, um, of Mendenhall's um, guns here, the penetration, the gap in the Union line, and the Confederate uh, pushed through that, um, and the roll of the ground, the nature of the fighting, it allows um, that part of Sugg's brigade to flank the line and roll up um, much of this, um, uh, this artillery line um, and drive it off of the, um, of the field all part of the collapse of the Union right on the battlefield in late morning and at midday on September the 20th. Uh, I had a question regarding Bradley and his battery with Archer being ahead of Buell. Why Eastet made it up here, but Bradley didn't? Well, um, Bradley had been directed by Harker not to go into, into the woods, um, and, um, and they were parked out here in the field, probably the south part of Dyer Field at, um, at some point or some place right there near the intersection with Glen Kelly Road. Um, but during, while Harker is on the front line, a Confederate artillery piece opens fire on Harker's position, and um, Bradley will be directed to send um, two guns onto the front line to try, try to suppress that um, artillery piece. Bradley will subsequently bring two more of his guns onto the front line. They will fire very rapidly, suppress that Confederate artillery uh, fire, and then Bradley brings those um, uh, four guns back out into the field. So they're already off the line when Wood's division is ordered to move. And uh, Wood's division moves with arms going um, first, then Harker second, um, and Bradley is trying to shadow Harker as he moves north. And so he actually passes through this field and gets up into the woods north of the Dyer Field before the disaster begins to unfold down here. Now, he will have positions to the, in this collapse of the Union right, but he's not on this line. He's already north of this position. And he will leave the battlefield with James Scott Negley right. in another battle. part of the story. Right. And there's the... When they pull these guns off, do they go back to drop out of um, yes, the uh, the guns that will get out of here um, will um, will go through the woods over this terrain onto the Dry Valley Road and will um, will escape through um, uh, through Lytle Gap in um, in the, the range of hills back um, back here. Um, and when you read the um, particularly Confederate accounts of uh, the um, the jam of vehicles trying to get up through Lytle Gap. Um, I think that is um, uh, some additional evidence that some of these guns, some of the 15 that the, of the 26 that were lost, some of them were probably lost back, going back that way, um, got tangled up on trees or, or tangled up in, um, in vehicles there. Um, the, um, um, uh, the caissons of the 6th Ohio Battery um, are even further back behind um, and, um, and the, um, uh, the, the sergeant in charge of, um, of them will have to abandon um, uh, the rear parts of two of the caissons to get them off because they get ta literally get, get tangled up in the traffic jam trying to get up through Lytle gaps. Is that where the uh, ammunition trains would have been too? Um, well, the, the ordnance wagons, um, there are little packets of ordnance wagons um, all over the place. Um, and um, 
Um, a, a lot of them are going to be up trying, they're going to wind up trying to go out through, um, uh, through Lytle Gap. Um, but there are others um, that um, actually wind up near, um, near Snodgrass um, Hill um, because Negley's going to take them off the field with, uh, with them. Um, ideally, what, um, uh, what division commanders wanted um, their ordnance officers to do um, was to, uh, to keep the, that packet of wagons um, and shadow the uh, division. So if the division moved that way, to move them that way as well. Um, and, um, and that's, that's clear um, in several, um, from several accounts that at least in some cases they tried to do that. Um, and, and that's gonna result in, um, in the division ordinance trains of a couple of the divisions to going off of the field with Negley under his direction. Any last thing you want to add here, David? I just want to mention uh, General Crittenden, because he's here for a brief moment in time. Crittenden's Corps Commander of the 21st Corps. Uh, he, uh, he is essentially rendered useless by uh, when Rosecrans parcels out the reserve and commits it to the front line, and so he doesn't have anything to do. He's, he's present. He observes the breakthrough. Uh, he comes back up here to the gun line. And, and then while Mendenhall is engaged, he's actually back in the woods behind us trying to rally mostly survivors of Sam Beatty's brigade. But, but uh, there's got to be people from, uh, from Tom Wood's other two brigades. There's probably some, some of John Brandon's people. He's, he's unable to get more than a handful of people, a handful of infantrymen to stop, reform, because he wants to bring an infantry line out here to support this gun line. But by the time he even gets 50 or 60 men together, uh, his staff is scattered through the woods trying to do that. And he comes back towards the gun line, and he finds that it's already uh, uh, disintegrating, basically. And that's the, the motivating factor for, for uh, Thomas Crittenden to leave the battlefield. And, and uh, 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 General McCook uh, will leave the battlefield uh, about the same time, other circumstances. General Rosecrans will leave the battlefield, and that's how we have uh, two thirds of the of the Army Command of the Senior Army Command leaving the field. All righty. Well, um, we have to um, at least leave this part of the field, but um, <laughs> instead of going northwest like um, the these Union troops did, uh, we've got to go southwest. There is not a Confederate infantry division to our south preventing our movement. <laughs> right. I'm going to talk down there, yeah. <laughs>